I've been trying to find a way to accurately measure a bevel gear. This is the bevel gear from the vertical head of my milling machine. I think I've come up with a solution. It's this little gauge. The gauge fits between the teeth like that. It's tapered. It has a flange which locates against the rear cone angle. And then it has this feature here which enables me to measure axial location. So we'll see if this works. Welcome back to Workshop Friend and I'm continuing my series of upgrading my mill and in particular the vertical head. I really wasn't expecting to spend um, so many videos on the vertical head and these gears but I really want to get this right and so I've come back to this topic. As I mentioned in one of my previous videos, the previous video in this series, uh, there was going to be a gap and that's because I was going overseas on a trip and uh, so in the meantime I put out another video so let's see if this works and if it gives me a better um, way of measuring this gear. So the gauge has a number of features. Um, firstly, the tapered portion there, which fits between the teeth. And then this flange, which is of a controlled thickness. And then finally, at the end, a conical section, which is at uh, 45 degrees from the center line, 90 degrees included angle. And to get that dimension um, precise, I used uh, 1 8 drills and uh, measured um, over the outside diameter. And uh, that was necessary because um, the dimensions of this are quite critical to its effectiveness. So I took quite a lot of time over this, uh, got it just right, and then updated my drawing and used those dimensions for seeing how this fits into the gear. And then from that, I could determine various dimensions. So I put the bevel gear back on the faceplate and clocked it true. This is the same setup I had when I machined this face to remove the burr in a previous video. It reflects the, the tapered nature of the teeth. And if my calculations are correct, the center line of that gauge should be on the pitch circle cone of this gear. I can pick up the surface of the gauge and it should just sit there by itself and I'm going to zero that so I've removed the tool post so you can get a better view of what's going on so you can see the gauge is inserted until it rests on the outer diameter in fact the cone angle, the rear cone angle and here we are, we're picking up zero. And then as we rotate this round, that's showing that the height of the tooth there is five thou higher on that side, and five thou higher on that side. So that's one of our measurements. And uh, I'm going to repeat this at four places around the circumference. Again, I'm making it. I'm taking care to seat this on the the rear cone angle. Okay, that's slightly. That's one thou under. So we need to just move the carriage across slightly. So, at four places around the around the tooth perimeter. We've got two readings of five thou, one of six, and one of seven. So I'm going to take an average reading, and we'll transfer that figure, we'll transfer that dimension to the drawing. So the other thing I need to do, I need to know the distance between the outer or the rear cone angle, as signified by this flange, and the stylus on the DTI, and that that of course is important so I need to transfer that dimension to the drawing as well so I've done my best to estimate that it's difficult to measure uh, but uh, it's a very it's going to have a very small impact because of the code angle is actually it's only five degree included angle and uh, transfer that onto the drawing too now while I've got all this set up I thought I would also see if I can determine whether I really am picking up the cone angle 
So I've got the top slide still set over at 45 degrees to match the cone angle. I've swapped the DTI over for a clock so that I can more accurately measure deflection. This is on center height, so I've used my, my uh, tool setting gauge for, to make, make sure this is on center height. And what we want to do now is just see as I traverse inwards at 45 degrees, what the deflection is on the clock. And um, I'm going to transfer that to the drawing, and that should give me a rough idea for whether I really am picking up the cone angle. Okay, so we've zeroed out, and then we'll traverse inwards again. Okay. So we've picked up there along the full length of the gauge about 23 thou of movement. Just double check that. Yeah, that's 23 thou. I was very encouraged to discover that when I transferred the center line of the gauge to the drawing, it lined up exactly with the cone angle of the bevel gear. With the same setup, I was also able to check the dedendum, that's from the cone angle to the root of the tooth. And that was the same as my previous measurement. So it's now time to try and locate the axial position of the Roland cone relative to this rear surface. The gauge is inserted in the teeth and again located up against the, the rear cone. And because this is machined at 45 degrees, it's actually now parallel to our surface plate. And uh, you can verify that. So uh, as I move along here, yeah, I'm quite pleased with that. So that's, that's parallel with the surface table. And so I've set this, um, this up here as a, as a reference. And so if I touch off on the top of here, that's zeroed out. And what we'll do is we'll go around the circumference and we will measure this and uh, we'll get a, a difference between the height of this stack here and our gauge. Now, I since acquired a set of slip gauges, so I thought I'd repeat these measurements and I went round each tooth individually and recorded the difference relative to the stack and then took an average reading. The maximum variation over all 28 teeth was 3.5 thou, which I thought wasn't a bad result. So I took the average deviation here and used that as a reference dimension, which I transferred to the drawing. Okay, I've got the same setup now uh, with the other bevel gear. So I've left it in its housing and our datum is this scraped surface here. So what I want to do now is determine the height from the scraped surface to our gauge. So we repeat the process, but I've got a different packing now. Um, this is um, 1.424 that's our reference there and we're going to measure relative to that so I'm going to tabulate again around the circumference and use that to get an average reading I ended up repeating these measurements too uh, with my slip gauges and this time I had a total maximum difference between uh, amongst the teeth of 5 thou. And I wondered afterwards if this was because this is housed in a bearing. So actually we're also measuring potentially bearing clearance and possibly run out. Anyway, I thought this was an acceptable figure. So I took the average again and fed this back into the drawing. Now since I have better dimensions now of the bevel gears, I thought it was a good idea to go back and double check the center lines and the other critical dimensions 
so I'm double checking and I will take these revised dimensions back to the CAD drawing just to double check that we do have the correct dimensions for determining the mesh of the gears. Now before I commit these dimensions to the drawing and uh, come up with a final uh, gear mesh, I want to just double check something and that is the tooth spacing and the PCD. So this is as if I've um, unwrapped the outer edge of the bevel gear and uh, folded it flat as if it were a regular spur gear. And you can see here we've got pins between the tooth gaps on the PCD and uh, we know the caudal distance which is 0.195 for the outer diameter of the bevel gear for the PCD and uh, what we can do then is put these pins in the in the gaps and measure the distance between the centers and if we're on the PCD then um, the spacing should be even so I have made these gauges here um, they're kind of uh, they're similar to the previous gauge which I already made with the same taper here um, but the difference is that at the outer edge they have these tapered heads and the idea is that they're tapered at such an angle that the gap between them let me zoom in slightly the gap between them at the outer edge when they're correctly located is parallel so we can put a feeler gauge in there so we'll use that to double check that um, at the assumed PCD with the correct caudal distance, um, the spacing uh, between the teeth is the same as the spacing across the teeth. I think it is, but we will check that and see. This will just give an extra level of confidence that um, we have everything correct. The other thing it will do is that it will also help us to get a, um, an estimation of how regular the gear spacing is. So by measuring uh, that gap here, uh, we'll be able to see how consistent the gear spacing is, um, both in terms of circumferential position, but also depth of cut. I think that'll be interesting data to have as well. I color coded my results, marking each tooth individually. Blue represented a 25 thou cap, which was nominally correct. Red was 24 thou, and yellow was 2 thou under at 23 thou. And I marked the circumference for each tooth. So here you see the overall distribution of measurements, with the majority of them being red, which was 1,000 on the nominal size. I think this is really pushing the limits of what I can do with this equipment, but it's just giving me extra confidence that my readings are making sense. Okay, I'm going to take these measurements now and then put them into my CAD drawing and see what difference this makes to the measurement of the mesh of these two gears. So I took all these revised dimensions and upgraded my CAD drawing which was quite a lot of work actually but uh, the final result gave me a better indication of how these two gears would mesh together. Now I understand that bevel gears are often stamped with a number to get the correct mesh and indeed one of my bevel gears was stamped as were some of the other parts. I don't think this was a measurement I think this was just a grouping of parts together but it certainly indicates that there was a degree of fitting originally to get the correct mesh. It's only as you zoom in on the CAD drawing that you can see the displacement of the gears from the correct mesh. As it turns out, the horizontal gear was almost bang on the center line, but the vertical gear is out by 13 thou. So the CAD drawings told us that we need to um, raise the bevel gear by 13 thou. Uh, on top of this assembly and there are a number of ways of achieving that um, the first way might be to put a 13 thou washer in here 
uh, between the spinner um, or on top of the spinner and the bevel gear. Um, actually making a 13th hour washer is a little bit tricky. I'm not uh, set up to do that at the moment. Uh, the other way of doing that is to cut a portion off this and then make a wider spacer which can um, effectively become the adjustable spacer for that extra clearance. And the final way to do that is just to remake this spinner. So um, this has already been uh, repaired as you will have seen in a previous video and uh, what I could do is just uh, change the thickness of this so add 13th hour in there. So I looked in my scrap bin and I came up with this piece of steel which has a conveniently uh, convenient diameter in there and an outer diameter from which I can get this ring. That's just about right. So uh, I think this is the way to go. This is um, a mild steel. I've just cleaned up the back there. It seems to sh machine quite well. It's not particularly heavy duty. All it's got to do is provide um, the correct spacing and a bit of geometry there to make sure it all goes in the right direction. Okay, this is the arbor I used uh, before when I when I renovated the previous spinner. Uh, so I just clocked up the outside, and I'm just going to face skim this face here to make sure it's square. And um, I've reduced this inner diameter so there's enough room to measure from the front with my depth micrometer, so I can get in between. Um, in that on that face there and the other thing I'm going to do is after I've cleaned this up I'm not going to put adhesive on the face I'm going to put it around the perimeter so that I can get this right up against the face and measure that depth accurately so you can see it's a little bit out from the previous setting the diameter is clocked in so that's true it's just a question of squaring up this face. Just giving this a quick wipe down with methylated spirits just to remove some of the oil. oil. describing in the extent of the taper so that I've got a line to work up to. Now having come this far I didn't want to make a mistake so I was very cautious in coming to the final dimension. I went quite carefully with the taper turning because I didn't want the glued joint to break. Actually I needn't have worried. Later on it's extremely difficult to separate. Five thousand to go. Okay, one and a half thousand to go.
that's point one two five and a half so half that under but I think that's clear that's close enough so we'll um, just chamfer that inside surface there and remove this and we need to cut the keyway then Removing the ring from my arbor was a little bit difficult. Uh, I'll spare you the details, but I think I'll approach this slightly differently next time. Okay, this is my setup for cutting the keyway. It's only got to be a clearance, um, it's not precision. So I've uh, marked it out and uh, got the center line vertical. And I'm just going to cut uh, just inside the, the lines that are scribed on there. Initially, I tried to do it um, horizontally, but of course, with the clapper box opening that way, and I can't lock my clapper box, that just wasn't going to work. So I've changed it around so it's vertical, more orthodox way of cutting, and uh, we'll just um, remove that material. So here's the original spinner and a new one. You can see I've made the slot a little bit narrower. It didn't have to be as big as that. And uh, the reverse side. So this is 13th hour thicker on the rim here. So that uh, should bring our gear into alignment. And that fits on top of here. And the gear that goes inside the cone like that and that fits on there like that. Well it was my intention to reassemble this vertical head. Uh, I've just run out of time so checking the actual mesh of the gears we'll have to wait till next video when I'll also be painting the body, uh, filling it up with the correct lubricant and solving the other gasket problem. So I hope you join me for that video.